who am I? What do I do? Why am I here talking to you? Well, in the original TED Talk, I taught them how to build a garden. You can check that out on my website. What I want to talk to you about now is why you should grow a garden. For me, it started with a turkey sandwich. I was a freshman in college doing what most deadhead freshmen would do, skip class, smoke a dube, get the munchies, and head for the nearest sandwich shop. Little did I know that fateful turkey sandwich from the Radical Rye Cafe in Madison, Wisconsin, would change the course of my life forever. I found myself staring at this sandwich, wondering about its origins, the tomatoes, the mushrooms, the turkey. And then it hit me. I had no idea how this sandwich came to be. I became fixated on the fact that I'd never grown anything I'd eaten. Of the thousands of meals, this was the first to stare me back and cause me to ask, where did you come from? Who raised you? How did they do it? So it was after that one sandwich at the Radical Rye Cafe, I started learning how agriculture had gone awry. And I mean radically awry. From then on, I reformed my college experience. I dropped out. I went to farming workshops. I read books. I talked to farmers. And at the end of my freshman year, I made a bold decision to spend the summer as an intern at an organic farm in southeast Wisconsin. I was in love with the idea of farming and learning to grow my own sandwich from scratch. You might wonder, what did my parents think about this change of heart? No more tuition? No more dead tours? They, they took it in stride, like most parents who think their kids have finally lost it. I remember my mother's reaction best. Okay, Farmer D, we'll see how long that lasts. And Farmer D, a new identity, was born one out of passion and purpose, a man on a mission to educate others about a food system gone awry. Well, I've had a career in sustainable agriculture ever since. I farmed, managed farms, and designed farms and gardens all over the country. It's ironic that the seeds of my inspiration came from the heart of the Midwest, which was plowing itself wall to wall with corn and soybeans. So let's go over some of what I learned. Chemists have been successfully engineering agriculture to produce enormous volumes of food. The agribusiness focus on quantity and profits led to the increased use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Since Americans are keen on short-term measures for success, we ignored the indigenous wisdom that considers what might be the impact of a decision on the seventh generation to come. Well, the proverbial seventh generation is here and experiencing many unintended consequences. Here's a dirty dozen. First of all, those practices led to the abuse and exploitation of human labor and the animals they were growing to feed us. The ingredients for that sandwich, turkey sandwich, could have traveled over 3,000 miles, eating their own share of fossil fuel calories while leaving a trail of carbon dioxide and pesticides behind. Our food is heavily dependent on oil, tractors, trucks, refrigeration, and chemicals, all petroleum-based. It's kind of amazing that people get so worried about eating calories and give no thought to the petroleum-based chemicals they consume. Now, we need bees to pollinate, but pesticides, pollution, and the commercialization of the bee industry are causing the collapse of bee colonies worldwide. Did you know that one of every three bites of food you take depends on pollination from a honeybee? No more bees, no more tomatoes, no more cucumbers for your turkey sandwich. Now we need topsoil to grow food, but modern agribusiness continues depleting soil faster than it can be replenished. For every unit of food we consume, six times that amount of topsoil is lost. We need biodiversity, but instead of heritage seeds, you're seeing engineered super varieties, like tomatoes that are genetically modified with tough skins so they'll survive a cross-country trip in a refrigerated box. Pretty? Maybe. Tasty? Definitely not. One of the results of single crop farming, monocultures, are super pests and diseases, which require stronger pesticides and more chemicals just to match the previous year's productivity. 
Engineered agriculture buys nitrogen. It's called ammonium nitrate. It's a crude source of artificial nitrogen. Unfortunately, plants often use a small percentage of what is provided, and the runoff goes to wreak havoc in other parts of the environment. Here's a bit of irony. America's favorite fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, is Afghanistan's most popular explosive. Think about that. Now, when it comes to the meat part of our diet, there's more grim news. Agribusiness packs cows, pigs, chickens into horrendous growing conditions. Then they pump them with antibiotics and hormones to grow them big and fast and just to keep them alive. Now, ecologists have been studying what happens downstream of big corporate farms. The impact of the Midwest is tracked through the waterways all the way to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Also, medical researchers have been warning about chemicals increasing our risk for cancer. Doctors prescribe stronger antibiotics for the new bugs that are making us sick. Here's a scary statistic. The rate of girls reaching puberty between ages 7 and 10 has doubled in the last decade. But chemicals aren't the only part of the problem. It's the government subsidies for corn and soybean production that is responsible for making junk food cheaper than vegetables. Cheap high fat, high sugar, high salt foods. It's no wonder obesity is a national health crisis, along with the chronic health problems that follow. And what's really scary is most people don't realize they're consuming industrial food, nor the consequences of eating that way. Well, enough of what's wrong. How do we make this right? Well, let's go back to some of those farming workshops that started me off. And while I learned about the source of food, I came to discover the soul of food. Rudolf Steiner was an early 20th century Austrian philosopher who advocated holistic biodynamic farming practices. He was getting us to think about ancient methods that nurtured the earth as a living organism. These techniques could be the antidote to the problems I've been describing. Now, biodynamics is a spiritual approach to farming. It treats the earth as sacred, working in harmony with the earthly and cosmic forces. Now, as much as I'd love to, I'm not going to talk to you about farm gnomes and garden fairies or how to bury cow horns stuffed with manure on a new moon so as to harness the forces of the inner planets, moon, Mercury, and Venus. Indigenous peoples, ancient peoples, knew these forces. They had the time to observe the cycles of the day, the cycles of the seasons. They weren't distracted by cell phones, iPads, iPods, TiVo, or TV. You know, their internet was the solar system. When you garden, you develop a deeper understanding of the forces of nature and the nature of forces. Most biodynamic farming lessons aren't any more mystical, really, than the farmer's almanac. Plant and harvest with the cycles of the moon and stars, or whip up an old-time potion for controlling pests and disease. Some lessons, though, might seem odd to the uninitiated, like planting leaf vegetables during astrological water signs root crops during an earth sign, and fruiting crops in a fire sign. Let me take you back to some of my early farming days and talk about four specific differences between biodynamic and conventional farming practices. Lesson number one, animals play a key role on a biodynamic farm. I had pigs, chickens, goats, and cows. Each animal provides for the needs of different crops. For example, chickens for fruiting vegetables, cows for leafy greens, and pigs for potatoes. Conventional farms typically raise one type of animal or one crop, creating an imbalanced farm ecosystem where manures become pollutants rather than nutrients. Lesson number two. Gardens and farms should be polycultures, not monocultures. At any given time, I would have dozens of crops and varieties of each to maximize ecological diversity. I would use intercropping and crop rotation to help with pest control and productivity. Monoculture farms grow crops to maximize profit, unfortunately at the expense of balance. Lesson number three. Plants need natural sources of nitrogen. Biodynamic farmers plant cover crops. These legumes like peas, vetch, and beans take nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. And then when plowed under, it's called a green manure, returning organic matter and nutrients to the soil. In the short-sighted view of engineered agriculture, this strategy would be deemed non-productive. Lesson number four. 
Biodynamic compost heals the earth. Just like we add vitamins to our diets, biodynamic farmers add herbs to their compost. Chamomile, yarrow, dandelion, stinging nettles, and valerian are some of the essential herbs that help transform garbage into gold and impart healing properties to the soil. Compost provides the needed biology, life, billions of beneficial macro and microorganisms to nurture and grow healthy plants. Conventional agriculture relies more on chemistry than they do on biology. Now, I loved farming, but realized that being a great organic farmer wasn't enough. Getting more people eating and growing organic food seemed the only way to stop the destruction of agriculture, the environment, and human health. Now, to reach more people faster, I decided to take the Johnny Appleseed approach. After about five years of training myself, it was time to train others. So what's the modern Johnny Appleseed have to do to change our food culture? First, I have to demonstrate that before we grow food, we have to grow soil. Over 60% of typical trash that goes into landfills could actually be composted. Now, I've been fortunate to work with Whole Foods in the southeastern United States to implement large-scale composting. Now, quality compost doesn't come easy at this scale, so I turn to the power of the biodynamic herbs to stimulate the decomposition process and enrich the final product. Here's an interesting statistic. A family can compost over 10 pounds of food waste a week. A grocery store chain could compost 10 times 10,000 pounds a week. Just think of the waste we'd reduce and the new soil we could generate. Now my Farmer D Biodynamic Compost is sold at Whole Foods throughout the Southeast to both customers and farmers. Beyond composting, I want to talk about how the Johnny Appleseed strategy works. I help cities grow communities with gardens. I help design one of the largest community gardens in the country about 40 miles from Atlanta in Swanee. This park, Harvest Park, is a seven acre community garden already with a waiting list of enthusiastic gardeners. I've also been helping private developments incorporate organic farms and gardens into their master plans. One recent project is a 10 acre farm at Natarar in New Jersey. One of the things this farm does is provide fresh produce, herbs, eggs, and meat for its on-farm culinary school and restaurant. Another recent project is Longleaf Preserve in the Florida Panhandle, where a Farmer D farm anchors a 2,500-acre residential development surrounded by a 50,000-acre preserve. Now, on a much smaller scale, I set up and maintain gardens in people's backyards, sometimes even their front yards. Now, I'm not going to tell you to rip up your lawn, but growing vegetables, fruits, and herbs in your yard is much more sustainable than a traditional landscape. My company designs, plants, and maintains dozens of school gardens, and we're helping those schools and low-income communities find funding. Too many kids think carrots grow on trees, or they come from the grocery store. I can't tell you how many times parents and teachers tell me Kids feel differently about food they grow. They actually want to eat it. You know, since that fateful turkey sandwich, I've been on a mission to teach what I've learned and inspire others to be more conscious consumers. Gardens teach people about the heart and soul and source of food. We're educating one customer, one family, one school, one community at a time. Get curious about why cheap food damages our bodies and our environment. Try to change your food habits just a little. Close the distance between farm to table. Whether it's one basil plant on the patio, a compost bin, or a raised bed garden in your backyard, appreciate the taste of good food. Feel the difference. You can learn smart ways to grow just a little of your own. Value the effort that it takes to produce it. You're less likely to waste what you put out energy to nurture. Understand the real cost of growing food. Because food should be good, clean, and fair, accessible to everyone, and paying a living wage to those who produce it. Please join me in returning to a sustainable world. Next time you have a turkey sandwich, give it some thought.